now. Okay, we're recording. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. Thank you, 106 people today. We're honored. Um, we're here, me, Penny, Telsey Convener, Jolanta Hansen, our events officer. Jolanta, do you want to say hi? Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> Enjoy. Uh, is our social media coordinator here? Celia, are you here? Is she here? Many people are coming and then I get lost. I can't see who's there and who's not. Anyway, um, welcome everyone. Today, we are happy to be having Anna Frankenberg Garcia. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name well, Anna. Uh, yeah, fine. <laughs> She's going to present something very, very interesting. Collegiate for academic writing. Collegiate is um, an application, a website by the University of Surrey. So she's going to explain to us everything about Collegiate, the research they've done, and uh, everything you need to know and how it can help uh, your students. So welcome, Anna. Uh, please, everyone, I will send a WeTransfer link towards the end of the webinar with the certificate of attendance. Um, we're going to upload the recording on our YouTube channel. And what else? Feel free to discuss in the chat box, OK? We like collaboration. Don't fight with each other, OK? <laughs> Just share your thoughts and any questions. And we're, we're going to pass uh, over the questions to Anna at the end. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to disappear. Bye bye. Okay. Th thank you very much, uh, Penny. It's really a pleasure to, to be here. And one of the advantages of lockdown is that um, I can be here at home and talk to so many people uh, around the world uh, about uh, my project. So uh, I'm going to talk about Collocate. And uh, this is a project that I developed with funding from the UK Arts and Humanities Council. And uh, it's been developed here at the University of Surrey, where I work. Uh, I, my area is applied linguistics. I have a PhD in Applied Linguistics from Edinburgh University. And uh, I've been working here uh, at the University of Surrey for a while, where I teach on the MA program in uh, translation. And I also have PhD students in translation studies. My area is mostly corpus linguistics, and I work with corpus applications in lexicography, in translation and in assisted writing and particularly academic writing. And I'm going to talk about Collocade, which is a project about, it's a lexicography project with applications for academic writing and assisted academic writing. So I hope this interests people working with technology enhanced learning here at Baliap. So thank you for listening to me. So this is uh, my campus here. You can see uh, on a sunny day, it's raining today. So, um, and if you don't know where the University of Surrey is, we are in Guildford, uh, a short train drive away from London. Okay, uh, and I want you to start this talk by asking you to do a fill in the gaps exercise. You don't have to write anything down. Just imagine what words you might use to fill in these gaps. And I'll give you a few minutes just to try and fill these gaps in your minds. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about this exercise. So um, I want you to reflect now, what kind of English do you think these gapped sentences are about? 
Uh, is it English that you speak at home? Is it English or what kind of English is it? And uh, I also want you to think whether it is possible to use more than one word in each gap. Okay, so think about the answers. And here, let's look at some possible answers for this exercise. So in this first one, you can have words like this. I hope you got one of these words. If you didn't get any of these, you might have got others that also sound okay. Here are some words that could fill in the second gap, third gap, fourth gap, fifth gap, sixth gap, and seventh gap. So if you look here, some of the gaps will take more than one word. Some of the gaps, like the second gap in sentence five and the gap in sentence six are preposition gaps and only one looks right. Okay, and these, as you can see, they are gaps for testing your recall of academic English collocations. Uh, so this is written academic English, it's general academic English, it's not about any particular discipline. And if you work with teaching uh, EAP, you will be familiar with this kind of sentences. So what exactly is collocation or like the exercise was about collocation gaps? What collocations, if in a very loose definition, you can think of them as words that are conventionally used together or words which just sound right together. And they're very difficult to explain to students because there's no right or wrong. It's, they just sound as if they should go together. And you can have lexical collocations like immediately goes with a parent. If you need a, an adverb to describe a parent, immediately is something that just goes right, it sounds right. If you need a verb to use with activities, monitor sounds right. They can be grammatical, like uh, a preposition to use after depend, it's depend on something or interested in something. And they can be both. For example, here you have increase, uh, and the preposition that you use after increase depends also on what comes next. So you have increase in prices or increase of 10%. And here, based in Lisbon or based on data. Collocations uh, have been studied very um, widely and in the phraseological school they attempt to sort out collocations and distinguish them from other kinds of phrases like collocations are different from idioms from fixed expressions binomials and so on but then it, it's it's not a clear-cut science for example you have expressions like cold feet and if you take cold feet in the literal sense they say it's a collocation but if you use cold feet as a figurative expression it's an idiom so the phraseological school tries to sort collocations in these ways um, i'm taking a more Freudian perspective where i'm looking at collocation uh, from the perspective of lexical items that occur together more frequently than just by chance. And you can check this, actually, if you have a corpus. So uh, let me give you an example. Take a look at these two possibilities, light increase or slight increase. If you go to a corpus, and I'm looking these up in the Oxford Corpus of Academic English because I'm interested in academic English. And if you look at the frequency of light in the corpus, it's quite frequent. There are 14,000, almost 15,000 occurrences of light. Slight is a less frequent word. It occurs only just over a thousand times in the corpus of academic English. It's still very frequent anyway. But if you look at their occurrence, 
one word to the left of increase, so immediately before increase, you will see that light occurs just once and slight occurs 97. So then you can compute statistically what is more frequent and if this frequency is likely to occur more than just by chance. And here the relation is under one, is not significant. And here you can see that slight increase is significant. So slight increase occurs together a lot more frequently than just by chance. When you're dealing with collocation, it's often not just a question of right or wrong, it's a question of conventional or not. So how, collocation, how do collocations affect reading? I'll give you a little exercise. Take a look at these two sentences and tell me or think which one do you think is easier to read? Okay, so these two sentences are practically identical, but um, I hope you agree with me that number two is a lot easier to read. And the only thing that changes between the two sentences is collocations. In one, you have fine use. It's not really a conventional collocation, whereas effective use is and highly improve against greatly improve. So you read effective use and greatly improve like a chunk. You don't read word by word, whereas fine use, it takes you a moment to put them together highly improve, same thing, because you're not used to seeing or hearing those words together. And that's why collocations affect readability. So there's lots of research on this, that known word combinations are processed with less effort, because of course they're read as a single chunk and not each word separately. This is what John Sinclair, a very famous corpus linguist, called the idiom principle. And this is because why collocationally rich texts are much easier to read and perceived as more fluent. And as uh, teachers, if you teach EAP, you will know that some texts, they just take so long to read. And that's probably because you're putting together word by word and you're not seeing all the collocations there, which you can read as chunks. So collocations and writing. Writing is much easier for you if you don't have to stop and think of collocations. Thinking of collocations when writing, for example, you're writing and you need to use report in your essay or your research paper, but you don't remember which verb you can use with report. Submit a report. Okay, that sounds good. Or you can have a similar question. Oh, I need hypothesis. I want to use a an adjective here with hypothesis, which one sounds right, working hypothesis, oh yeah, that fits my what I want to say. But if you can recall these collocations as a chunk, uh, then you have, don't have to think about what verb can I use with this or what adjective can I use with that. And you can concentrate on all the other aspects of your writing. You can concentrate on the organization of your writing, on, on on the overall meaning and not on micro bits of the writing. How about collocation and second language learning? Collocations are really difficult for second language learners. Loads of research um, pointing to that. And uh, second language learners, um, they um, make errors like an increase off prices. It's a very common error. Or simply atypical uses, words that just don't sound right together, like a light increase instead of a slight increase. But there are also loads of less visible issues. For example, a very limited collocation repertoire. They know collocations, but only have very few that they can use without, uh, as a chunk, without you know, having to stop and think. There's also collocation avoidance, uh, purposefully try not or not daring to use certain collocations because they're not sure if they're right. And then 
There's the opposite, collocation overuse, just using the same collocation again and again because they feel comfortable. They're like collocation teddy bears. You feel they are um, something that you can rely on all the time. And there's also possible misconceptions about collocation strength. What you think is a very good collocation is actually not and vice versa. So these are less visible issues that affect second language learners. Another problem is that sometimes collocations clash in the first language and the second language. And so here's an example, increase of prices, a very common mistake that comes from uh, Latin languages. So here in Portuguese, subida de preços is a literal translation. And if you translate word for word, increase of prices, subida de preços, you'll get a mistake. And same thing here, a light increase is just a literal translation from Portuguese, for example. But certain cognate collocations are also underused. There's evidence that, for example, empirical study is underused by Brazilian researchers, even though they sound exactly the same. Now, this is another problem, and it, it's a problem that emerges when you are already at a little more advanced stage of proficiency, and where you think that things like for instance, sounds better than for example, because for example is too similar to what you say in your first language. So you think that for instance shows that you know English better uh, than if you say for example. So that's another common misconception among language learners, especially if they are a little bit more proficient. How about collocations in academic English or English for academic purposes, EAP? Well, academic English has its own set of collocations. And if you compare this, um, so these are collocations that you use with table in general language. Uh, and I've put in red um, the collocations. I highlight them in red and compare here with uh, academic English collocations. So you can see here um, that the collocations can be quite different in academic English and in general English, especially for words like table, which have two different senses they have. Um, and in this case, it's clear. So how do you go about teaching uh, EAP collocations? Uh, learners are often unaware of their collocation problems. So like they translate literally from their native language and they think it's going to work. And they cannot ask for help if they don't know that they need help with collocations. So what can you do to help learners with uh, academic English collocations? I think one of the first things you can do is raise awareness of collocation. Many people are not aware of collocation and, you know, little fill in the gaps exercises like that, just like the one I did at the beginning of this presentation, they can work. And you can raise awareness to the fact that some words fit and sound natural and others simply don't. And you can emphasize it's not just a matter of grammar and errors, it's not black and white. And also very important that fluency and, and readability is affected. So if they want to write fluently, they need to you know, go with the conventional. And there are loads of textbooks with explanations and exercises about collocation. So you've, maybe you have used some of these in your teaching, like English collocations in use by McCarthy and O'Dell, or academic vocabulary use, same authors, or focus on vocabulary by the Schmitz. And these are all really good books. Here's uh, English collocations in use book. And uh, it's useful to raise awareness of collocation. And you have here an explanation from the same book. And you know, you can um, raise awareness to collocation just by asking uh, learners to read like writers. So to read, not just to get the 
content and the meaning of the whole text, but to pay attention in how words are used in the text and in how words combine with each other when they're reading. So try to read in a way that will help you write. Another thing that's important is to emphasize the importance of using dictionaries for writing. Most people use dictionaries when they want to look up the meaning of a word, but it's really important to uh, get into the habit of using dictionaries for writing and to look up words in dictionaries for the, uh, even if you already know the meaning of the word, just look it up because it can give you lots of extra information. So here's an example of the Macmillan English Dictionary entry for research. And you can see here examples of how research is used in context and collocations like research into, research on, carry out research. So even if you already know the meaning of research, here you can see how to use research in the context of a sentence. And then it's important to teach learners how to navigate dictionary entries. So here's the Oxford Academic uh, Learner's Dictionary of Academic English. And uh, collocation is normally secondary in uh, dictionaries. And sometimes you have to navigate the entry. Here you can see uh, how to get to the collocations, but it's not really quite obvious to everyone because they're often secondary in dictionaries. The meaning usually comes first. And then there are collocation dictionaries, uh, which you might have heard of. So there's the Oxford Collocations Dictionary, Macmillan Collocations Dictionary. The Macmillan ones, uh, they have a section of the Macmillan Dictionary online, which is just about collocations. And you can go straight to the collocations, which is quite easy to navigate. And um, then you have here also the Longman one, which has an appendix with an academic collocations list. Remember I said uh, general language collocations and academic collocations can differ. So uh, there's this appendix with around 2,400 uh, 2, EAP collocations in the Longman dictionary, which they can use. And if you are uh, using technology enhanced learning tools and you know about corpora i'm sure you do if you have come to tatiana's uh, webinar uh, so here are you can look up collocations directly in corpora which is where uh, lexicographers get their information from in the first place so you can go straight to the raw data where lexicographers get their material from and look up collocations. Um, it's a bit clunky. Uh, I like COCA because it's free. I don't like the interface. It's very clunky, but you can see here, you can go straight to academic collocations in the corpus of contemporary American English. And it's a very good corpus of academic English, a, a subset of the corpus contemporary American English. Uh, this is much easier to use. I don't know if you heard from the Flux Library developed by researchers in New Zealand. Um, so here you just click research and it gives you collocations here in this case, research plus a noun, research project, research program, market research, research findings, so on. And the source they're using is the, an academic source. And you can see here, the problem here is just that this is not uh, expert academic writing. This is BO, so the British Academic Written English Corpus developed by Hilary Nessie and her team. In, and, and so this is student writing. It's uh, mostly uh, student writing from British universities. And also uh, the marvelous scale. Um, I love scale because this is just the tool you use if you want to use corpus linguistics and you don't want to say the word corpus linguistics. So you just type table here and you get a map of how table is used with all its collocates. Verbs used with table as subject, verbs used with table as object, adjectives used with table, and you can see. Uh, one problem here, though, is that scale is just general English. So you get here in this summary, you get, you know, uh, 
different meanings of table all mixed up. So you have the academic sense of table, things with rows and columns, and the non-academic sense of table, like a place where you uh, put your food on, uh, all mixed up. So this could be a little confusing. So in summary, you, there are loads of excellent collocation resources available, but there are some limitations. So uh, EAP textbooks, they're really great, very good for raising awareness of a collocation, but they, there's a limited space in those books to cover everything. So it's just a sample, a very good edited sample is just a sample. And it's not really practical to consult a textbook while you're writing an essay or a research paper. Then you have general and academic English dictionaries. Uh, these are better to, to consult in the middle of writing. Uh, but remember, uh, the information of collocation is not really obvious in, in these dictionaries. You have to navigate the entry and you, you need to be taught about it. And also there's limited space and limited coverage of collocation. Then you have collocation dictionaries where the collocation uh, information stands out right away, but most of them focus on general English, uh, less on academic ling language. Although I did mention the appendix to the Longman Dictionary, which has uh, 2,469 uh, 2, academic English collocations. Uh, if you use corpora directly, the problem with corpora is that they're generally not very intuitive and it takes a little training, steep learning curve to learn how to feel comfortable using corpora. And also the problem is that you have noisy data uh, because you know it's not edited by lexicographers. This is just the raw material. So you get irrelevant data, misleading data, and sometimes too much information, which can be confusing. And then learners don't always know how to select a corpus that is appropriate, don't know how to build corpus queries, and they can misinterpret results, and this can happen quite frequently. And sometimes they can get distracted by corpus data because they see one thing and they follow it up in a way, and then they didn't know what they were looking up in the first place. Then you have corpus-based tools like Scale and Flax that I show you. And again, they have noisy data and scale is not academic, flax is based on student writing. What's more, looking up collocations as you're writing can interrupt your thoughts and the flow of your words. So, uh, and learners can tend to overestimate their knowledge of collocations. So you won't look them up you will not, writers don't look up collocations if they are not aware of their limitations. So this is why we created Collocate, an alternative solution, which I'm going to show now.
So um, what's different about collocate? Well, it can help writers expand their collocation repertoire. It's just not, it's not just correcting their writing, it's giving them suggestions to help them expand their vocabulary. And it does this with reminders, although underlined words are reminders. Hey, do you want to check how this word is used in context in academic English? And then if you want to, it gives you suggestions of collocations that you may not remember or that you use less frequently or that you don't feel confident enough to use or that even you could be unreasonably avoiding. And the collocation data is curated, so you don't get distracted by information that is hard to find, like right at the bottom of a dictionary entry, or uh, irrelevant, misleading, or too much information, like when you are consulting corpora directly. Another thing is based on data-driven learning. And this means the collocations are shown, they're not explained. And learners value examples and they learn from examples and that's why we emphasize them and we give learners multiple examples uh, to see how to use collocations in context and the integration with the text editor is interactive and works in real time so you don't have to stop writing and it's informed by research in human computer interaction so you have um, interactive menus where you get a collocation uh, and, and, and then you can expand these menus uh, as much or as little as you want to navigate them. And all the menus, uh, they take into account working memory constraints, so they don't overburden you with information on collocation. They show collocation progressively and the examples are short and easy to read so that they don't occupy too much in space and also memory space. So what's the data behind Collocate? Uh, so Collocate is based on 561 academic lemmas. These are the little words that you see underlined when you're writing uh, and the words for which we give collocation suggestions. Now, this doesn't say much, but these 561 um, words, they have been carefully chosen from academic word lists. So they're really the words that are used most frequently and widely in general academic English. So they were really carefully chosen. And, um, and they give rise to over 32,000 collocation suggestions. Now, remember the academic collocation lists in the appendix to the uh, Longman Dictionary, it has only around 2,400 uh, collocation suggestions. So here you have uh, over 32,000. And then uh, for the top ones, like almost 10,000, we have curated corpus examples. So that help you see how to use the collocation in context. Now, where are these suggestions and examples coming from? They're coming from expert corpora, not student writing, uh, not general English. They're coming from the Oxford Corpus of Academic English and the Pearson International Corpus of Academic English. And we also link to more examples if you need them. Uh, these uh, further examples are from scale, so they're linked to uh, general English, but they can also be useful. So how do you access Collocate? Well, you just go to our website, Collocate UK, and here you just click on try the prototype. Please remember this is still a prototype, though, so there's still a little uh, a, a few bugs that we need to fix. Uh, it's still, uh, the tool is still being developed, but it's quite usable as it is right now. So this is the interface that you get. You need to register to use it. And, and, and that's just because we need to keep track of who's using it to, uh, for accountability to our funders, the UK uh, Research Institute. 
Uh, and the prototype works online, which means you don't need to have MS Word or uh, any other proprietary program to use it. And it's compatible with lots of devices and operating systems. Uh, you can even use it on your phone. I don't recommend writing an essay on your phone, but uh, it is possible. It works on your phone. And then your texts are private. We cannot see or store your text. So it's not like you are uploading your precious research uh, onto Collocate. We don't see them. And how can you use Collocate in class for teaching? Now, I had to think about that. I haven't taught academic writing in a while, but I was thinking, and maybe you can give more ideas and you're in a better position than I am. Uh, but I, 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 I thought one of the things you can do with Collocate in class is fill in the gap exercises. So just like the gaps I gave you uh, in the beginning, you can actually ask the students to copy sentences onto collocate and just to, you know, raise awareness to collocation. And one important thing is to raise awareness for different things about collocations, like noun plus verb and verb plus noun collocations are different. So for this gap here, if you look the noun plus verb, you won't get the word that you need for the gap because what you need here is the verb plus noun, like this. And then you get lots of suggestions of how to words that could fit in this gap here. You can coordinate the activities, uh, regulate, monitor, organize, etc., etc., etc. Uh, another important thing that you can do with filling the gaps exercises is, is raise awareness of which word governs the collocation. So you can see here in um, number three, you have two words that are underlined in collocate and based from our academic English word list. And you have system and adopted, and it's important to raise awareness to which word governs. And here it's not system, that is governing the gap, but adopted. So you need to look up adopted. Another thing, it's important to raise awareness that preposition choice may depend on both the word that governs the collocation and what comes next. So here you have increase and what word do you use after increase? It's important that you check you can use increase in, increase over, increase off, but you need to see uh, what word comes next to be able to decide what is the correct preposition. And then you can encourage students to practice writing directly in collocate so they can write an abstract on collocate, for example, or just a paragraph. I would suggest writing on collocate and copy into another text editor because this is all online. And then if your computer crashes, uh, you can um, lose your work. So um, it's not good to write a whole research paper on collocate. Don't do that. Write short paragraphs and, and then copy into your regular editor uh, or an abstract, something like that. And, um, and as you're writing, this can help you expand your vocabulary. And also it can help you with your writing because you don't have to think or spend so much time thinking on what verbs or nouns to use, uh, it just gives you the suggestions there and you can concentrate on the more important bits of your writing and how to organize your ideas. At the same time, you can sort of gain confidence to start using collocations you've never used before without looking them up in a dictionary, right? Another thing, you can ask students to copy things that they have written, paste them onto collocate. When you do that, you need to click. Uh, normally, Collocate activates automatically once you press the space bar after a, a word. But um, if you just paste a text, you need to activate and de deactivate Collocate. And uh, if you paste, this is an abstract I wrote. And um, you can see all the words here that are underlined. It just show you, gives you an idea of the extent of our coverage. You can see lots of academic words here being covered. 
What's important is to note is that it's not a spelling checker or uh, so if you spell a word wrongly, it won't come up in, in collocate and it doesn't correct miscollocations. It just gives you collocation suggestions. So it's not a tool for, uh, it's not a grammar check or a spelling check. Another thing that can be quite helpful is to help you when you're marking. So if you need to get an idea, if you see a miscollocation in one of the texts by your students, you can just write the word uh, that governs the collocation on collocate and immediately get suggestions uh, that you can give to your students. You don't need to write a paragraph. You can just write uh, words there. Uh, the other thing is that um, our editing tool focuses on collocation suggestions and vocabulary expansion, but we do have a separate, very newly launched database of common errors. And it consists of 361 collocation errors and other issues that we found widely and frequently in academic English writing. And we also give solutions to how to fix those problems. These include things like lexical choice. Uh, this is very common, accept to pay, but you really should say agree to pay. And grammatical choice, you ought to see very often in the one hand and the correct form would be on the one hand. There are also problems, not about which words, about the collocation words, but about how you use the collocations. So here is countability, not give an advice, give advice not ability of using, but ability to use. So this is a problem of how to use ability and use together. Um, and here also in academic English, you wouldn't say a bit small because it's too informal uh, in an essay, it's best to write something like rather small instead. And we got this database, we compiled it out of, uh, by researching a combination of learner corpora, advice from textbooks, advice from dictionaries, and advice from grammar books. If you want to access our uh, error database, uh, we have a web page here of collocation errors, which gives you things like this. And very recently, we've uploaded the full database here, which you can download and share. Uh, we, we, uh, well, and use uh, in your classrooms. Uh, so what do you users think about Collocate? Uh, we haven't tested it recently, but we did test the, our early prototype versions, uh, version 0 0.1 to 0 0.3. Uh, the initial responses were quite encouraging. So uh, between good and excellent. And this was, you know, much earlier versions than the one we have now. And we got really positive feedback, like it's user friendly, has lots of examples. It's very intuitive and easy to use. And I like this. I like it when it gives only one example to begin with. And then later you can get more if you need more. Now, this is really important because the first example we give is the top collocation. Uh, so it's the most frequent or strongest collocation. So maybe the student can already get what they want there and there and doesn't need to seek further. But if they want to, they can uh, open another menu to get more suggestions. Another positive feedback, you can look for the word you're interested in on. Oh, they need to use collocate here, interested on, eh? without wasting time. Exactly. You don't need to switch applications. You can just use it from your text editor. And here, I like the fact that it gives me combinations of words that sound more formal and academic than I the ones I would think myself. So again, this is all about vocabulary expansion. Here we have some suggestions of improvement that came from people who tested the, the tool. More words could be added to collocate like adem academic words from specific areas. Well, since those early prototype tests, our database has considerably uh, increased. So we've um, expanded, but the focus continues to be general academic English. We are not addressing here um, medical English uh, or um, English for engineers or anything. 
And if you think of it, you know, medical English, people who are learning medical English, they're learning the collocations that they need to use in their professions, in their content classes. It's mostly these general academic English words that are less salient and that need a little bit of reinforcement. Another suggestion, maybe uh, Collocate could be compatible with text editors that we use daily, such as Microsoft Word. And um, I couldn't agree more. And we're looking into this, but Microsoft Word is a proprietary program. Uh, we don't want to make Microsoft rich, and it's really limited in the way you can integrate it. I do have a PhD student now working on possible uh, integration of Collocade with Google Docs. So something to look forward to. Uh, another suggestion, install, install an auto saving mechanism so the text that I'm composing is not damaged or lost. Um, yeah, um, there are here privacy and data protection issues and we're not, you know, we're we're just a small research team and we, we, we don't have the means to, to, to uh, store such a large database with everyone's texts and keep it private. So we just don't store the text. We did add an export to text button so that you can just download whatever you're writing on Collocade when you want to save it. And the interface could be more appealing. That's not really the important issue. I guess it's the last thing to improve. And we have since those early prototypes developed the visualization further. So this is an alternative visualization of uh, Collocate. So instead of seeing the menus on top of the text you're writing, you see it here on the tree view on a side panel. So it doesn't cover your text because sometimes the menus may jump around and it cover what you're writing. So if you use the tree view, it's always on the side. And you can just expand the menus as if you would expand um, it on the main uh, in-text view. So here, you know, it's just expand and uh, on the tree view with the examples and the, all the other options. And we're still, this is not implemented that we are uh, experimenting with this, what we call the fan view, uh, but this is still um, very uh, experimental. It's not implemented yet. So who's using Collocate? Uh, we haven't broadly advertised it yet. We haven't made a big campaign because it's still a prototype. Uh, our current version is 0 0.6. We're nearly approaching 0 0.7. And even though we haven't really advertised it, we have, you know, uh, Yesterday I checked and there were uh, 3,600 registered users from all over the world and uh, using it mostly for writing and revising. But you see there are 294 users registered for using it in their teaching. And the main activity, well, it's mostly PhD students who use it. Um, but you also see some master's students and undergraduate students. And, you know, even though there are much fewer university lecturers or professors in the world than there are students, there's quite a significant number of um, uh, lecturers and professors using, like almost 300 uh, of them registered to use. Research fellows, teachers of English, uh, of academic English, and so on. Uh, most uh, people uh, using it, I don't know, it's spread a lot in, in, in China, uh, Collocade, lots of Chinese PhD students using Collocade, and it must have spread by word of mouth because I haven't given a talk in China yet. Um, but you also see lots of native speakers of English using it, um, which is interesting because English, um, academic English, you, you're not born with it. You need to learn academic English. So even if English is your first language, you need to learn academic English. And also lots of people uh, uh, using it with Portuguese as a first language. That's because we did lots of experimental workshops in Brazil, and these people uh, probably continue to use Collocate. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for listening and for your careful attention. <laughs>
And this is uh, us, our team. Uh, my co-investigators are Professor Robert Lev from Poznan in Poland and Professor Jonathan Roberts from University of Bangor. And we have a brilliant team of researchers, uh, Geraint Rees, Peter Butcher, and Nirvan Sharma. So thanks to my team too. And I'm here to answer any questions now that you um, Thank you, Anna. To ask. Thank you. So I will start like with three questions and then our events officer Yolanda is going to take over. So um, my, the first question is, everyone was impressed by the demo. So they want to find out where is the link to that demo video because it's a very useful video to show to your students as a training about Colocade. So where can we find the demo? Okay, uh, you can find the demo in our website. Uh, let me see if I can. Um, uh, let's just, uh, I need to share the screen again, right? Mm -hmm. um, let me just go okay. Uh, and uh, someone actually mentioned about the website. They tried to access the website during the webinar, and it okay. showed that it's not a safe link. Uh, they, they couldn't directly go oh. to the website. Are there any issues that we should be aware of? Uh, problem. Uh, no, we we haven't uh, had any issues yet. Uh, no one has reported any. Uh, issues so, so maybe uh, our attendee should look at cookies and privacy is, is it is it in china or something that the uh, issues have emerged because yeah, i know I, person, I don't know can, can you see the website now on the screen yes yes we can see yes it. okay so if you want to see the video you click here on about uh, and uh, a two minute video about collocate, just uh, click here and, and uh, check our video. Oh, for some reason, ah, here, you, you, it, it's just here. Can you see that? Yes. So you can expand this. So you can play the video in class. Okay, our next question is uh, by Sam Wilson. How do we ensure students do not just take the suggestions without thinking about the appropriateness for their particular essay assignment. Like people are very, very interested to find out about retention. Does collocate lead to collocational knowledge or it is just, I don't know, a copy paste activity? Uh, well, um, I'd love uh, people involved in uh, teaching academic writing to test that. Um, we Anna, come can you, can you that it is potential location. Want to test that? Mm, something is going on with Anna's connection at the moment. Sorry. Uh, can you? Can Anna, you hear you're me? cracking. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can, yeah, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Ah. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, so uh, can you uh, repeat the question, please? Uh, so there are a lot of R&Ds uh, who are asking about if Colocade leads to increased knowledge. Oh, yes, 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 I, I, I remember that. No, we, we, we don't have any data on that. We, we, we spent most of the research developing the tool was about, and now, you know, it, it would be really good to test that if it leads to retention. We don't know. Uh, that's the. Um, but you're welcome to to test it and to let us know if you do. Okay, Yolanda, you can address the rest of the questions. People ask a lot of questions, which is good. Yes, uh, thank you, Anna. That was very interesting. Um, there was a question uh, from um, one of the uh, attendees, I think it was Alison. She was asking whether it's free. Um, I, 
assume you can subscribe um you can log in then but yeah you need to pay at all no it's totally free you just click on try the um prototype and then uh you they will ask you to to register um just to use uh, just register once and and okay. then you can start using it and the only reason why you need to register is that so we can ac account uh who's using it to tell our funders give us some more money <laughs> people are using the tool <laughs> Thank you um, for clarifying this. Uh, a question from Ronnie. Um, are you happy for us to encourage students to sign up and start using the current prototype? Oh, yes, yes. And if you, you have no objections, bugs, bugs, please let us know. But yes, no, it's, it's quite usable now as it is. Um, I myself was writing an abstract uh, yesterday and I was using Collocate to, to write that abstract because, you know, it, it just helps um, to get the flow of your writing because you don't have to think of the chunks. Uh, they're there, they're given. Yes, um, uh, lots of people asking about uh, the slides. Um, um, I've, I've seen you share them uh, so they can download as a link. Uh, is that right? Um, Yes, I, I, I can, uh, I, I, I will upload them to, to the website. Um, okay. We have here um, publications on the okay. website. Uh, and, and, and then, then and um, I can also send us the slides and we can. Yes, and uh, we will upload okay. here the right. presentation okay. here with a link to the slides. So don't worry. Uh, and, and I can send Penny and Yolanda uh, the, the link or okay. the slides. So that's we can then add the, the link to our website so anybody can just um, go there and uh, click. Yes, and yeah. It, there download. are other slides here which you, can, which you can get, but these slides are more about the research behind Collocate and not so much uh, when I talked to Penny. Uh, to decide about this talk, we discussed it and we thought it would be good to emphasize less the research, the corpus linguistics research behind the tool and more the applications of the tool. So these slides are more or less new and, and I'll let you know That's about very them yeah, once uh, yeah. I upload them. <laughs> Thank you. And there was also a question from Warren. Um, at what point does it stop being the student's own work? What, what's your opinion? Ah, well, that's a philosophical question about <laughs> academic writing, yeah? Do you want to write, if you want to write literature and if you want, uh, don't use Collocate because it's going to uh, help you uh, write with all the conventions <laughs> that you normally use. And when you're writing literature, maybe you want to sometimes be unconventional. Yeah. But I think the main thing about academic writing is not to be original uh in in the way uh, in the words you use but to be original in the ideas you express uh because the more conventional collocations and the more conventional academic english you use when you're writing the easier it is to get your original meanings across so i think academic writing is really about being really clear about which you want to say it's not the place for being original and yeah. if the question is about the examples and copying the examples uh, and the examples we give in collocate they're just too short they can't be used as plagiarism and and actually the the user would need to adapt the examples to fit their own text so you can't possibly you do any plagiarism with um, collocate. Okay, and the last question, because there were uh, lots of comments um, about ethics, the ethical side of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, for example, um, word gives spelling and synonym suggestions, and this seems to be an extension of those functions. What's, what's yeah, your that, that, that's how that's how the idea was born. Um, it was actually I was my, my daughter was um, doing a, a, a PhD and we were this I, I was discussing with her about writing and all and 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 she 
he said, oh, she was using the synonyms in word and she, she, she was telling, oh, it was good if it gave me um, also not just synonyms, but what verbs I can use in this, uh, with this word or what adjectives. Uh, and that's how the whole idea was born. It's just um, with my, uh, in a conversation with my daughter. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you. Can I, can I ask a question as a simple attendee? Yeah, of course. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm listening to this very interesting discussion and I'm trying because to find out how we can use it during the classes. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in what ways we can use it. I mean, the first idea that comes into my mind is about raising awareness about error correction. I mean, common mistakes they're making. Can you can you give us like a few other ideas, like how we can incorporate it in into the learning process in class? Yeah, well, that that's what I was trying um, to 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 do with these slides uh, because. Um, uh, I, I'm not uh, involved in any direct teaching of academic English at the moment. I teach on the MA in translation and uh, I'm, I'm teaching other things right now and, and, and not academic writing. I have taught academic writing and, 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 and you know, um, so I think you teachers will have more ideas to give me than I. To, 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 to someone who's actually teaching academic writing at the uh, moment. But um, I, I, I try to think about them. And I, I think it's nice to copy fill in the gaps exercises or even to do those exercises that you have in, in, in your standard textbook. Instead of filling in the gaps in the book, you can fill, you know, copy the sentences Yes. Onto, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was okay, a good an experiment, yeah. and I think it's nice to to do it together uh, and maybe to project a uh, collocade and, and and so that you can get into the real details of it about which word governs the collocation and that not all suggestions given will fit what you're trying to say. So it's a lot about raising language awareness, really. And I think it can help an EAP tutor with material development. I mean, design um, activity about oh, yes. things yeah. much more easily, get the multiple, you know, uh, suggestions like and create like a multiple choice exercise, even maybe like a hood game. I mean, why why not? And this yeah, is something, yeah. and this is something I've I've been thinking like. Uh, yeah. I, haven't, I haven't been to many EAP classes that actually vocabulary is the main focus. I think it's a little bit neglected. I don't know about I don't know about other people, but I think in my in my practice, the material I'm teaching, I could include something more about vocabulary. And I'm running an experiment uh, for the spring semester, and if it's successful, I will come and present it. But I think collocate is not only for self study. It can be used for material development. Yeah. It can be used in the classroom for, for raising awareness or correction. So yeah, I think it, it you can expand this in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm not so sure about error correction because we specifically don't correct errors. Um, it's too no, difficult, I mean, especially so if we don't raise, leave your text. Yeah, raise awareness about their mistakes. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If you identify the errors, you yeah, you can say go and look this up in collocate. Go and find a better word to use here exactly. in collocate. Yes, yeah, um, yeah. That that would be brilliant. Yeah, um, that would be yeah. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. So you can underline words in an essay and tell students to try and replace those words with better words using collocate. That would work, I think, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Anna. Uh, I have posted the certificate of attendance lots of times in, in the chat box. Um, um, like I have received a few messages right now. Thank you very much, Anna, for coming. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, we have prepared our webinars uh, and we are going to share a list uh, of our next webinars very, very soon. Excited 
uh, exciting things are coming. I'm really excited about this. Uh, uh, so thank you, thank you very much. We're going to upload our uh, recording on our YouTube channel. Thank you, Anna. We are very pleased and honored that you accepted our invitation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank it was you, my Anna. Pleasure. I would suggest a round of applause for Anna. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I can see Tatiana there. <laughs> Hello, Tatiana. Thank you. Hi, Tatiana, the star, our star. <laughs> Everyone, yeah. Malila. Uh, oh, I can see some people I recognize there. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So um, I think many people are going to uh, try collocate from the EAP field and then we can give you like more feedback so you can. Yes, yes, please do get in touch with us. We would really love to hear from you. That's really feedback is really important. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Much.